Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the head of safety policy at Facebook, Antigone Davis. Hi, so they told me that was gonna be a difficult act to follow and they weren't kidding. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. As a former middle school teacher, a mom of a teenage daughter, and now working to keep kids safe online, I have a bit of a view into the hard work that you do. And I can't tell you how much I'm filled with appreciation, admiration, in fact, awe at everything that you do. So thank you very, very much for letting me to be here. At Facebook, our mission is to give people the power to share, to make the world more open and connected. When we share information and connect, we achieve extraordinary things. New ideas, innovative solutions, and deep friendships. That's true in school, and it's true on Facebook. As educators, you know the innovative sparks sharing and connecting create. You see them every day as your students discuss to kill a mockingbird or work in pairs to complete a biology lab. But people will only connect and share if they feel safe and comfortable to do so. That's true of students, it's true of teachers, it's true of everybody. And it's true online as well as offline. It's particularly important online, where you don't have the facial cues, the voice intonation, and other body language that are so important to our connections with people. That's why years ago, we began working with the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and your next speaker, Mark Brackett. We've heard, worked hand in hand with leading researchers as well as the people who use our products, including teens from around the world, to help bring compassion and respect into the heart of our products. For example, if there's something on Facebook that is upsetting, makes you feel embarrassed, annoyed, or offended, you can use what are called our social resolution tools to help start a conversation with the person who posted it. More than eight million people use these tools with great success every week. Tools we developed in consultation with Yale and Mark. And we also work to build bullying prevention resources and outreach in the heart of our product as part of our bullying prevention hub. And most recently, we collaborated in support of the emotion revolution, Inspire Ed. It's an incredible set of tools for educators and teachers and teens that will enable deeper, more compassionate connections offline that we think will impact our connections online. Inspire Ed is a place where passionate educators, community leaders, teens and parents can connect and work together to positively impact school climates and the overall well-being of the teens around our nation. Inspire Ed focuses on broad variety of activities, lessons and projects in social and emotional learning. Our hope is that educators and students will share their lessons, their ideas, their stories through this site so that the resources grow and the message spreads. In fact, many adults and youth around the country are already promoting positive climate in their school and communities. And we are gonna award the top 20 change makers with an invitation to a summit at Facebook in August, which includes up to $10,000 in grants to support bringing social and emotional learning to their individual schools. Our commitment to our mission to give people the power to share and to make the world more open and connected goes beyond our platform. And it's why I'm so excited to be here today to introduce Mark Brackett, a pioneer and a partner in the effort to give all of us the tools we need to share and to make the world more open and connected. Can you hear me? Great. My job is to ask you all how you're feeling, right? Um, you think I'm kidding? Uh, I actually would like you to take a moment and Think about, how are you feeling right now? It's the beginning of your big conference. That's the kind of enthusiasm at an education conference? Come on, people. 
How are we feeling? All right, there we go. Good. So thank you for the introduction, Antigone, and I'm excited to be here and share with you some of the work that our center has done uh, in our nation's schools and with Facebook. Let's see if our clicker works. There we go. I'd like to start off with a quote. Can I ask everyone to just get comfortable in your seats? Good posture? You'll live longer? I have no research to support that, but <laughs> it feels right. And just take a nice long inhale and just get present. And all of us know Maya Angelou, famous poet who we sadly lost a couple years ago. And she writes, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I'd like you to just take a moment and think about how that relates to you as a teacher, as an educator. Raise your hand if you see the relevance. Good, if you don't, you have to leave. <laughs> so we know that how we make people feel matters. And um, for me, you know, some people, when they see this quote, they think of very pleasant and positive things, and some people think of unpleasant experiences. And of course, we all have both. For me, I unfortunately did not have the best uh, years when I was in school, especially in middle school. I was horrifically bullied, um, had a difficult time making friends. I, I always say I was more interested in my friend's parents than my friends. Right? I was like, why are your parents going through a divorce? I'd like to interview them. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't interested in, you know, being on the hockey team, uh, hence my career. <laughs> but for me, it was interesting about, uh, I don't know, five years ago, I went to visit my middle school. So it was 30 years ago. And I just had zero memories of anything I learned. All I remembered was the relationships. Who was that teacher that actually cared for me? Who was the teacher who supported me? Who were the kids who hurt me? I didn't remember what they said exactly, but I remembered how they made me feel. My hunch is that many of you can relate to that. So I'd like you now to just take a moment, and if you're an educator, I'd like you to think about a student in your school. If you're not an educator, think about any child you know. And I'm gonna take you through a brief reflection. If you'd like to close your eyes and turn yourself, or turn inward, that'd be great as well. Let's imagine it's five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning, and you're waking up. How do you feel? Okay, I'm getting some good feedback here. <laughs> Think about a third grader, fifth grader, high school, it doesn't really matter. How does that child feel in the morning? It's breakfast time. What's going on in that house for that child that you're thinking about? Is it a wonderful morning where mom or dad is saying, good morning, my vision of the future? <laughs> or is it something like, get out, I fit to say one more time, I'm gonna lose it. Healthy breakfast, unhealthy breakfast. Okay, commuting to school, how do you feel? You walk into your school as this child. You look around, you see people, the walls, the people. How do you feel? Class one, two, three, four, five, math, science, language, arts, history, phys ed. How do you feel? Lunchtime, who are you with? How do you feel? Afternoon classes. Think about it. More subjects, more tests. How do you feel? After school, what are you doing? How are you feeling? All right, you get home. Family, no family. What are you doing? How are you feeling? It's dinner time. What are you eating? Are you eating alone or are you eating with your family? How are you feeling? It's the evening. What are you doing? Homework, no homework, too much homework. TV, no TV, technology. How are you feeling? You are this child and you're going to sleep. You're putting your head on your pillow. What's going on in your mind before you fall asleep at night? Pleasant, unpleasant feelings? Anticipation, excitement, elation? Or fear, sadness, or frustration? How many of you believe that how that child feels matters? So, obviously I wouldn't have a career if it didn't. <laughs> what we know is that emotions matter for five primary reasons. And of course, you could take a whole course on this. But the first is attention, memory, and learning. Think about that child. How that child feels will affect his or her attention. So for me, when I was a child, I was feeling stressed all the time. I was worried all the time. I had two brothers that had some challenges. I had a mom who was 
worried about why she worried. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was, it, was, it was interesting. But nevertheless, when I think back, I think my brain, right, was so preoccupied with safety, with security needs, with meeting people, with friendships, that it wasn't really available for learning. Decision making. Has anyone here ever made a bad decision? <laughs> Turn to your partner and share. <laughs> um, the, we, know, we know that how we feel influences our decision. And for those of you, who, which are many, who are educators in the room, right, what we know, very interestingly, is that how you feel might even influence the way you evaluate students. Close your ears on this study. So we did a study two years ago where we randomly assigned educators to just think about a good or bad day. And then we asked them to write about it, just for five minutes, and then we gave them essays to grade. Anybody want to know the results of the study? Uh, there was one to two full grade differences in the way educators evaluated the essay just based on their feelings. What was most interesting to me about that research was that at the end of the study, when we debriefed, we said, do you believe that how you felt influenced the way you evaluated the essay? What do you think? No way. 85% said no. So it's not to say that we're like it's doomsday, it's just to make us aware, right, that how we feel is coloring the way we see the world around us. And it happens oftentimes outside of conscious awareness. One way to become more skilled is just check in with your feelings. The third is relationship quality. I don't know about you, but does anyone here have a colleague, if you can watch my face for a minute, who walks around a little bit like this? Anybody? Or where I work, it's like this. I always think, like, who taught you how to use your chin that way? It's like fascinating to me. Now, how many of you, when you see that facial expression in your school, think to yourself something like the following? I want to work with this person for the rest of my life. No, because emotions drive our relationships. They are signals. Right, they tell us to approach or to avoid, don't they? Right, this kind of face is not saying, come give me a hug. <laughs> right, it's saying, stay away, I got more power than you. You, you know, whatever. The fourth is physical and mental health. Think about it. If our nation's youth don't have the strategies to manage all of those emotions they're experiencing, aren't they at risk? How many of you believe that that child who you were thinking about if they don't get strategies to help them manage their feelings, could have or be at risk for challenges with anxiety or depression. Raise your hand. Yeah. Where I work uh, at Yale, we have a lot of students, unfortunately, right now that are at risk for these kinds of mental health problems. The fifth is everyday effectiveness. And I could spend all day talking about this, but one thing that we've learned in our research over the last couple of years is that this concept of like perseverance, right? You gotta have grit, you gotta push, push, push. Maybe a little misguided. I don't know, does anybody feel that way? I hope I'm not alone. I think that we need to think about supporting children more. Um, let me give you an example. When I was that 13 year old who was being bullied, my father, who wasn't really knowledgeable about how to manage and help me manage my feelings, he put me into karate. Right. Do I look like a tough guy? <laughs> I was like, I like to analyze the moves. Uh, it does happen, I mean, you should know that I do now have a fifth degree black belt, so. Uh, yeah. I could, if I felt like it, I could eliminate anyone in this room. But um, I still do it more for the techniques than for the, you know. Oh. Nevertheless, I was terrible. Like when I talk, when I say terrible, I mean like terrible. You know, I couldn't punch, kick. If I blocked, it would hurt. I would say, oh, I don't want to get hurt. And I failed my yellow belt test. I was devastated, because I was a bullied kid, remember, and now I'm going to karate to become a tough guy, fail my yellow belt test. And think about what we do to support kids, right, when they fail, right? What do we say oftentimes? You gotta work hard. Some of the adults on my left said, Mark, right, you gotta, you know, to write a passage. Like, write a passage? I'm not sure about that. How about like a hug, right? <laughs> right, how about, honey, like it's understandable that you've been bullied in school and now you failed your test that you must feel awful, 
right? Let me give you some strategies. Let me give you some techniques and tools. But how many of us have a formal education in emotional skills? So what I'd like to talk about today, very briefly, is a study that I did over the last couple of years. Um, about four years ago, the singer Lady Gaga and her mom opened a foundation called Born This Way Foundation. And they asked me to join their research advisory board and we decided to work on a project together, which we call the Emotion Revolution. And it started with a study. We wanted to know what is the state of emotional affairs with our nation's youth. And so I'm gonna to present to you right now the data from 22,000 students across our nation. And it was a study funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Essentially, what we asked them was one big question. How do you feel when you're in school each day? And as you can see here, it was a pretty um, diverse sample. So here are the findings. I'm gonna ask you first to think on your own. Think about percentages, think about a pie chart. 100% of the day feeling pleasant or unpleasant emotions. What percentage do you believe these are high school students from every state, public and private schools. What percentage are pleasant versus unpleasant feelings? Just put it in your mind. And now I'll show you the findings. So when we ask students to describe in their own words, what are the feelings that you have each day at school, of these tens of thousands of words that they wrote, Sadly, 75% were negative, and just 23% were positive. So to me, that's concerning, right, as, a, as an educator. If I were the CEO of a company and I found out that my employees, right, felt a negative emotion 75% of the time, I'd be really concerned. Here are the top three. So in their own words, children told us that the top three feelings they have in high school are tired, bored, and stressed. Now when we asked them what percentage of time do you feel these emotions, what we found is the following. 70% of the time they're saying they feel bored. 80% of the time they feel stressed. So that was pretty concerning. We didn't even ask them about tired because we never thought tired was a feeling. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's the number one experience that they say they have when they're asked about their feelings. And we know there's two types of stress, don't we? There's the good stress, Right, the stress that I have right now, presenting in front of thousands of people, right, preparing, trying to be on target, keep the time, right, exciting to get to share this work with all of you. And then there's a the stress that, unfortunately, I think many of us experience way too often, right? The stress that makes us physically sick, that weakens our immune system, that impairs our performance. The stress that I had in middle school, right, where I was worried about my survival, where my brain was so filled with cortisol that I couldn't concentrate, that I couldn't perform well. We're not sure what percentage of that stress is the good stress and the bad stress. That's our next line of research, but I think it's something we need to really think about carefully. The good news is that we asked students, how do you want to feel? And what do you think they said? I'll tell you. They want to feel happy. They want to be excited. They want to be energized. They want to be inspired. They want to feel safe, comfortable, all of these what we might call positive or pleasant emotions. And I guess the big question that we're gonna have as a nation is how do we bridge that gap? How do we go from tired, bored, and stressed to happy, excited, energized, and inspired? Now, we also ask students about different life experiences that they have in school. I wanted to share with you some of the data. I was very interested in, in meanness and cruelty since that was what I unfortunately experienced. Look what we found here, that students who are saying that people are being mean or cruel to them are feeling lonely, fearful, and hopeless. For those of you familiar with correlations, the correlation between meanness and cruelty and hopelessness was 0.5. That's a pretty strong association uh, in this kind of research. Students who said, what I'm learning is relevant to my goals in life, guess what? They're the most interested, respected, and happy students. Guess what? In my school, teachers deliver engaging and interesting lessons. They're the ones who are less bored, most respected, and happiest. Guess what? Teachers who encourage creativity in their classrooms, they're the happiest, most interested, and hopeful students. Guess what? Students who get along well with others tend to feel accepted, connected, and supported. So we know right, that these emotions matter and are making a difference. To me, the two big findings in this research project are 
meaningfulness and relevance, and connections with people. Right? Those are the two primary drivers of students' positive emotions in school. Now, would you agree we need to close the gap? So in our center, we focus on two things. One, developing people's emotional skills and creating a more positive emotional climate in schools. But the first step is, I believe, we have to shift people's mindsets. Because some people think emotions are fluffy, right? Emotional intelligence, those are the, that's the soft skills. I'll tell you right now, we wouldn't have a center at my university that has 35 employees with 25 researchers if emotional intelligence was a soft set of skills, right? These are real skills. And by the way, emotions are in your brain as well. <laughs> Just like cognition, emotion is there sitting right next to it. So, and oftentimes driving it, as we now know. So the first step in our work is to shift that mindset. Do we believe that emotions matter? I can't hear you. Yes. All right, now we're going somewhere. We have a set of skills and we have to shift our climates and that's what our research shows creates the outcomes that you see on the right side. So what is emotional intelligence? It's a set of five skills. The first is recognizing emotions. How do I feel? How do you feel? Can I read your facial expressions, your body language, listen to your vocal tone? As a matter of fact, let's think about this for a minute. I could use a little compassion right now. Right? I'm a little stressed out. On the count of one, let's see if we can make the universal sound of compassion. Three, two, one. Oh. I'm not sure about that. Let's try it one more time. Like deep compassion, people. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, that was good. Now let's imagine you are in awe, like you just can't believe what you're hearing. Three, two, one. Oh. All right, see, not bad. So that's recognizing emotions. It's in facial expression, body language, vocal tone, physiology, cognition. The second is understanding of emotion. Where are my feelings coming from? Why am I angry? Why am I sad? Why am I frustrated? Take 30 seconds with a partner. What's the difference between anger and disappointment? Go. And what makes people feel angry versus disappointed? Okay, time. Honest raise of hands, like super honest, like someone who's willing to bet me a cappuccino at the break. <laughs> Who believes they understand and can clearly differentiate the psychological differences between anger and disappointment? Raise your hand. Okay, five people. <laughs> so, I'm here to tell you, anger right, has a theme of injustice. Right, that's unfair what you just did. Disappointment is about unmet expectations. So when I failed my yellow belt test, I'm disappointed. I thought I was gonna get in, you know, the yellow belt. I did everything I could. If I believe that my sensei sabotaged my performance, <laughs> I'm no longer disappointed, I'm pissed actually. <laughs> uh, so that's anger. The strategies that we would use to help a child manage disappointment and anger same or different? different? Different. So here's the deal. Unless we know the psychological experience, the underlying emotion that a child is feeling, it's very difficult to know how to help that child. We can't just go by what we see, because there's a lot of social norms around this stuff, right? Boys don't cry, and girls do other things. And <laughs> I couldn't think of what they do, so I just said it. <laughs> but I don't even know where that was going, to be honest with you. <laughs> but I'm gonna stop before I get in trouble. So labeling emotions, right, is the third skill. You gotta name it to tame it, we say. What is that vocabulary word? Is it joy, is it elation? Is it down, disappointment, devastated, hopeless? Is it a calm, content, serene, tranquil? Is it in, uh, peeved, irritated, annoyed, angry, enraged? The fourth skill is expressing emotions, knowing how and when to express emotions. Does anyone here know someone who is socially inappropriate? 
So part of it is knowing, like kind of knowing how and when to share your feelings. There are layers to this, right? My own comfort level with expressing emotions, right? Some people give hugs, some people, hey. Um, there are social norms. Every classroom has a different emotional climate, doesn't it? If you're an educator, how many of you have worked in three or more schools? Raise your hand. Wow, a lot of you. Four or more. Five or more. Wow. How many of you can't hold a job? <laughs> um, I don't know where I'm going today with this talk. But nevertheless, think about it. Every school you've worked in has a different emotional climate, doesn't it? has a different feeling. This one is like the angry room. This one's the warm room. This is the room where nothing happens. <laughs> and the final skill is regulating emotions, right? What are those strategies that we use to help us manage all emotions? The emotions of stress. How do we deal with our stress? How do we deal with our disappointments? How do we get into that calm, content place? How do we feel comfortable with our status? How do we get into that yellow so that we inspire our students? What we know from our research is that Children with less skills look like the ones on the left. Children with more developed emotional intelligence look like the kids on the right. So I say, it's your choice. Which students do you want to raise? Which kids do you want to raise? Now there's two things. There's nature and there's nurture, right? It's very simple. I was born with the anxiety gene. I, you know, this is what my mother and father gave me, thank you. Um, I, like my mother, worry about why I worry. And now, even now, because I know about like metacognition in psychology, I, I worry about why I worry about why I worry. <laughs> like, I'm just like, what are you worrying about, Mark? Life is good. It's like, oh, but something will go wrong. Like, my grandfather used to say, you know, don't laugh now, you'll cry later. It's like, thanks, Grandpa. Thank you. Love you. So, you know, I had this nature-nurture problem, <laughs> right? Born with the anxiety gene and kind of had like a lot of worrying going on in my family. I used to say like, my neighbors, they used to play games at dinner. We worried. <laughs> uh, it's like, very different. So, the big question for all of you is, what was your emotional development like? What's your temperament? What did you learn about emotions growing up in your family? Did you have a nurturing family? Did you wake up in the morning and talked about feelings and had evidence-based strategies to help you regulate? <laughs> or you kind of left to figure it out? We don't want to leave anybody to figure it out. That's why we developed an approach what we call RULER. And it's the set of skills for emotional intelligence that we now are bringing to our nation's schools. And our approach is everyone. Everyone. If you work in a school, we want to respect you and we want to give you the skills from leaders to teachers, to students, to families, to custodians, to cafeteria workers, to assistants, to anybody. So when we bring our work to a school on emotional intelligence, we train every single person. And there are tools. We have four tools that we start with. And I'm going to briefly kind of introduce you to those now. The first we call the charter. We say there's too many rules, not enough feelings. Right? Most schools have classroom rules and school rules. What we say is let's, let's think about it a little differently. Why not just ask people how they want to feel? Just like we did in the Emotion Revolution Research Project. The kids told us that they want to be inspired, excited, happy, connected, supported, valued. And why don't we create learning environments that are guided by what the students themselves are telling us they want to feel? This is Dawn DaCosta, principal of Thurgood Marshall School in Harlem, New York. She's my hero, also my former student. And, oh, see? See, you guys learned. So there, there's the proof. Emotional intelligence can be learned. When she did this with her faculty, right, they said we want to feel respected, supported, and motivated. And now she knows what she needs to do and what they all need to do together to create a learning environment where everyone feels these positive emotions. This is what it looks like in a high school. It's a real kind of treaties. And fifth grade, this is one from, I just got back from Australia. They want to feel included, confident, appreciated, energetic every day, enthusiastic. This is a preschool, brave, love, safe. A school that, that, that teaches in Spanish, contento, respetado, querido, happy, content, loved. The second tool we call the mood meter. We say you have to name it to tame it. 
And it's a research-based tool that helps us build awareness of emotion. And what it does is it helps us learn the facial expressions, the body language, the vocal tones, the physiology and the behavior. It gives us a rich vocabulary to describe emotions. It teaches us that there are strategies to help us manage emotions. Right? We need to develop these strategies. Like, what do you do when you're kind of in the blue and you have to go teach a lesson? How do you get yourself into that yellow quadrant to be that inspiration? How do you get yourself into that green after a rough day and you want to go home and greet your own child and you don't want to be in that blue from all the kind of hard work you had that day? What's also important is that this is linked directly to the in to instruction. How many of us have learned how to differentiate instruction using emotion? Like intentionally creating a certain emotional climate to help students be more engaged in the learning process. What I know is that we're kind of biased in the way we teach because we, it kind of goes from our personality. I'm a green guy. Like my dream, what I'd rather be doing right now is sitting with all of you in a coffee shop, like chatting, <laughs> sipping, having a conversation. To get into this place, to be able to present to all of you, I need strategies, right, to get myself into that yellow. When I want to do a persuasive writing essay, when I want to write to our nation's education policy makers and say, listen, what are we doing? The research is there. We need to take this work seriously. I can't do it in the yellow. Right? Imagine I come in. Good morning, everyone. My name is... <laughs> it's a little weird, right? Or maybe I go in like the Zen master. I'd like to start my presentation off by having us take a collective breath. Right? There's only one breath, right? It's, 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 it's our breath, right? Could you imagine our secretaries of education sitting through that presentation? I can go in the blue and say, you know what? Let's think about our policies, right? Has any education reform effort ever had impact? <laughs> you know, I gotta be careful, right? Um, anyway, or I can go in the red, right? And say, we have enough research now, hundreds of studies have been published that a child's ability to regulate his or her emotions is an important predictor of their health, their well being, their ability to learn, the ability to build relationships, their ability to hold a job and be an inspirational leader. Think about it, the research is there. We need to take this work seriously. The time has come for our nation to take seriously the emotional development of our children and educators. What do you think? I could have been even more serious though. Artwork, look at this beautiful artwork using the same tool. We even de developed an app now that you could use to help teach yourself the mood meter. I'd like you to take a moment and read this quote. How many of you in the room could use a little bit more space between your triggers and your responses? So I love Viktor Frankl, and I think this quote really speaks a lot to what we don't have anymore in our nation. We don't have space. We're bombarded constantly with information. And what I think we need to focus on is building that space. And we've developed a tool we call the Meta Moment. And there are six steps to our tool to help us manage our emotions more effectively. And what we say is that if you take our six steps seriously now, you can avoid the 12 steps later. <laughs> uh, so step one is something happens, right? You are triggered. Do any of you have triggers? Come on. <laughs> Triggers from your colleagues, from your students, from your family members. Right, we need to make sense out of those triggers. Where is it coming from? Like, what, why is that bothering so much? How is it affecting my thinking, my physiology? We need to stop and learn how to pause. Because what we know is that when we're hijacked, we go right for the jugular. Right, if we can pause and activate what we call our best self. And by the way, look at this. When I interviewed over a thousand school leaders recently, they said, my best self is someone who's more compassionate. Think about it. When you're triggered and you activate your compassionate self, don't you think you'll choose more effective strategies to manage your feelings? That's what this tool helps us do. There are other tools like the blueprint, which helps us to build perspective-taking ability and 
be better at interpersonal problem solving. Because it's not just about me when it's an argument or conflict, it's about us. What we know from our research is that doing this work makes a difference. We've done randomized controlled trials and have shown that students who go through this kind of training have less anxiety and depression, and you can see their better academic performance, school climates become more positive, um, and the list goes on. I want to wrap up by saying that you heard from Antigone earlier that we have worked together to create a website, an open source website for educators like yourselves to build inspiration, to develop and learn activities, uh, to help create a more positive emotional climate in our nation's schools. And that site is built upon the emotion revolution research. So we took the study, we found out what children, our nation's youth, want to feel, and then we brought students to Facebook headquarters and had them work with us to think through, well, what does it look like? What do you want to see? What are the little 10 minute things you could do? What are the one hour lessons? What are the projects that you might do in your schools to create these different feeling states? And we're encouraging schools to build what we call inspire ed teams so that students can be the drivers. I know my work in high schools has shown me that if students are involved, just great things happen. Let them drive it. They have such great ideas. And the buckets are there from safe and comfortable to connected and supported to contented and balanced. And let's say you connect one of those, and then you get these 10 minute activities and your one hour activities. So please check it out. It's an amazing resource center that will continue to grow. We're super excited because what we're going to be building is an app and a website where a school can get automatic um, feedback uh, on the emotional temperature of their school. I'd like all of you to just sit up straight in your seats. Take a nice long inhale and an exhale. And just do a 10 second visualization about a year or two from now. Imagine all schools were adopting these practices, that every adult and every child had the opportunity to develop the skills of emotional intelligence. What would be different? What would be different in classrooms and our communities? As an academic, I can't make audacious claims because I get fired. Um, but what I can say are a few things to wrap up. The first, emotions matter. Are we in agreement? Yes. Say it louder, please. Yes. I can tell you that emotional intelligence is a real intelligence. It's not a set of soft skills. There are tools to develop this. And my hope is that you'll be on the same page as me and recognize that developing these skills in the adults and children in our nation's schools can make a real difference. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Mark. And now that his presentation is over, it was incredible. I just want to know, how do you feel? Motivated, motivated. Last week I stepped back from all that goes on during the day and I was drawn to a New York Times article that headlined, Schools Nationwide Push to Measure Students' Emotional Skills. The article focused on California schools and pointed out that measuring emotional skills is one thing, but focusing on the potential to improve academic achievement, well, it was front page news. The insight that we can take from Mark's presentation is especially relevant to the work that each of us does every day. All of you are tasked with handling students and a full range of emotional needs. It's the reality of teaching. And those needs impact learning, as we all know. The range of topics we just covered in this very first hour of the conference makes me excited for the next hour and the next day. You've heard powerful voices about important topics, but I want to add one point of my own. Ron Thorpe impacted our field. He impacted my office. He impacted my life. Every day, Ron comes up in conversation. His name, his ideas, his drive, and that unforgettable charisma. One of the things I loved about Ron most, whether it was talking on the phone or watching by video, 
was the love he had for Margaret, his wife. To see his face light up when this woman would walk into the room, or even the slightest mention of her name, was amazing to me, and I always cherished that about him. So he was a giant in the field. He was absolutely, incredibly larger than life at the national board. We were lucky to have him as a leader, even though it was for a very short time. And I'm humble that he asked me to come initially to be his executive vice president, and now to follow him as president and CEO of the national board. So rather than dwell on anything, Ron would say to us, we need to make this conference come to life. So the presenters that are waiting for you are ready to do that. So thank you, and I'll see you at the next plenary. Ladies and gentlemen, the breakout room sessions will begin shortly at 11.30. And please remember to visit the exhibit area downstairs. Thank you.